good evening welcome all to the professor bias das memorial lecture today it will be delivered by two different gentlemen professor kenji ohata and dr atul goel professor das was here during june uh, alumni meeting during that time we were fortunate enough to have a, um, have some time together what is the purpose of jain sikora tree the purpose of jain sikora tree is to provide shade for tiny titmoles so gentlemen and ladies i take you through the journey of professor b s das's life in a short way he was humble jovial and able to put people at ease he was that kind of a gentle giant he did not put anybody to uh, feel less or more he was born in uh, jaipur and of katak uh, the district of odisha on 28th of october to uh, anandinath uh, das and chitrakala devi his two sisters uh, nurtured him during his schooling he married his uh, mbbs classmate Pro professor sarla das in 1961 he did his mbbs from uh, scb officer and head of the department on 15th of october 1981 and um, he was uh, quickly put to ease by getting to know the departments the colleagues the residents etc he introduced uh, anterior cervical uh, uh, discectomy and fusion and uh, uh, and, the, uh, and the results were quite good in his hands following the rounds they usually used to have uh, a cup of coffee and then that that tradition still continues in the department his uh, contributions to craniovertebral surgery uh, transoral odontoidectomy followed by posterior fusion which is made by the uh, indigenously made uh, implants and then aneurysm surgeries and then he has uh, put the department in the current shape he was fondly um, uh, fond fondly remembering uh, con uh, as the con constant source of encouragement that professor arun verma professor narendra reddy professor madanna hv srimas dr kavir shastri and professor gauri devi provided a steady stream of um, students used to um, get short term training in the center and go away and then what else can be a greater reward for a teacher was uh, his response whenever um, any of his former students excelled in his field he also used to say my donkey has become a horse he which he he left the students in your best to be involved with nemans as a member of the institute body and the hospital management committee and academic council 
the neurological society of india acknowledges his contributions to the lifetime achievement award and some of us have been uh, fortunate enough to be uh, in interacting with him in june 22 at the neurosurgery audition and alumni meeting at namans this was the uh, photo taken at that time thank you and welcome to the lecture enjoy Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> It is a matter of honor, pride, and privilege to introduce this gigantic personality in neurosurgery, Dr. Kenji Ohara, who is leader, legend, and a landmark neurosurgeon. And he is internationally acclaimed for his skills in skull-based surgery, both for his skills, techniques. and his concepts he is known well known among many neurosurgical centers across the globe as a customer i have to introduce but otherwise he is popular among all the neurosurgical societies <coughs> so he started his undergraduation and graduation in osaka city university japan uh he he was he worked as a junior senior and chief resident from 1980 to 87 he was awarded uh, japanese from the japanese board of neurosurgeons his degree was awarded in 1987 and he worked as a short term lecturer from 80 87 to 80 only for one year he worked as a short term lecturer in the department of neurosurgery osaka city university <coughs> from then onwards for learning on uh, the for further, further prof professional training he went abroad and he did his research associateship under uh, dr anthony from medical college of virginia usa he was offered to stay back in us and he was given a license also but he denied and he continued uh, his clinical fellowship to learn the ent skills of uh, the skull based surgery at germany from um, Doctor Draff. So, so from, from here onwards, he came back to Osaka, and from 1991 to 2020, he stayed in only Osaka uh, City University in the Department of Neurosurgery. He served in various capacities. He started.
societies, and so on. Look at his areas of interest. His areas of interest are recurrent training for Jumas. Even it's a nightmare for many scholars, neurosurgeons across the globe. Petrochemical tumors and complex scoliosis lesions. Scoliosis surgery is a difficult surgery in entire neurosurgical spectrum, and he chooses to operate the complex scoliosis lesions. His choice of approach is Petrochemical approach. Look up approach. He usually tells. And Dr. Indra used to say that he used to cut a joke that uh, the Petrochemical approach with this, with the Petrochemical approach he can reach anywhere in the scoliosis. I'm fortunate to get the Osaka uh, Fellowship of Scoliosis Surgery. When I got the fellowship, I wrote a mail to Dr. Goel, who uh, replied back me to me and told that if you, uh, there is so much you can learn in Japan from their university. You just keep your eyes and ears open. Indeed, it is. There are techniques of uh, wide exposure, an avascular field, and uh, suction irrigation. All are his concepts. Meticulous way of presenting the things, meticulous way of noting down the operative findings, even meticulous arrangement of the lens. Of course, he, he will show in the videos, but this technique of actual drilling, drilling of the bone over the sinus, making it so thin, even the dissector is designed by him. This is called water dissector. And he would remove the uh, bone over the sinus with a small thing. thing. Lastly, the time, time management. He is best, of course, as many as, as, many, uh, as all the Japanese surgeons. surgeons. In, In the, the operation theatre, there, there used to be a clock, and the clock would display the time, and the time uh, from, the, uh, from which the surgery started. So there is a small um, uh, story behind this slide which, for which I have put. I was given a dinner by Dr. Hata at the time of leaving. So, I was supposed to come for this dinner by 7.30 and uh, with all my efforts I could reach at 7.31. So, there was already uh, one minute delay and there are 100 messages in my mobile and phone calls too and he was so worried about this one minute. So, thank you for your attention and I don't want to be in between you and Dr. Hata. Please come out. So, uh, thank you, Dr. Labo, for the introducing me. It is my great honor to have an invitation from the Indian Scalabes Society. So, this is my great honor. Also, I have an opportunity to, to give a talk in the Professor B.S. Dao uh, Memorial Lecture session. So, today, my, um, I'm, I'm, this is, uh, I first visit, my first visit to India is uh, nearly 20, 25 years ago. I visited uh, India over 30 times, probably. I cannot remember. I, my feeling is uh, I am Japanese Indian. This is my, my uh, impression. So today my talk is a surgical approach for treatment cerebral meningioma. And uh, seven years back, I was uh, president of the International Society of Meningioma. I organized the, this society. So meningioma, my uh, favorite topics. And also, tuberculosis cellular meningioma is my most favorite topic because this is a very, very conceptual disease. You must know the growth pattern of the meningioma. You must know the anatomy surrounding the uh, meningioma. This uh, uh, particular region arises from the, the, this area between the both optic nerve and this is the tuberculosis cellular, but uh, sometimes it's a, uh, origin is uh, shaped to uh, lateral side and uh, cross the pronomal spinal area and sometimes it's uh, origin from the uh, diagonal cellar. So this is my schematic drawing. Uh, it's pushed the optic chiasma posteriorly like this 
and uh, if it go grow, sometimes it uh, involves a uh, A1 and uh, A com complex. This is very complicated disease. And uh, even if this is a small one, it's uh, start to embed to the medial side of medial valve of the internal carotid artery, you know, of the canal, like this. And uh, if it grow, this is the same drawing. Typically, it's embed medial wall of the of the canal, and uh, involves a uh, A1, A com, and its perforators. This is uh, looks easy but difficult. And sometimes it uh, uh, extend over the of the canal. This is not homogeneous disease. And the uh, purpose of this my talk is uh, introduction for uh, endoscopic uh, approach for uh, midline scarlet tumor. And uh, I want to uh, describe our experience. And currently, we start to use endoscope. I want to show the role of endoscope in this particular region. So this is a schematic uh, drawing the, this uh, disease. That is why I would like to say this is a very conceptual disease. Tumor, this is meningioma. Meningioma arise between this optic nerve but invade cross the optic canal, like this. We don't know the margin of the tumor. If we access from below, we can remove the tumor between optic nerve, but we cannot remove this part. So this is uh, also a uh, schematic drawing in the coronal section. We can remove the tumor through the nose, but this part left be behind. We, we couldn't see this part. So my, uh, due to my experience, my impression is best approach is transcranial approach. So I use several approaches in this particular disease, by frontal approach, by front orbital zygomatic approach, unilateral front frontal approach, front lateral approach. I tried several procedures for the last 40 years with Professor Hakuba uh, and by myself and with Professor Goto. And this is my, uh, I, my experience, bilateral front base approach, unilateral frontal approach, but this approach is not good because between the tumor and the surgeon, there is an olfactory nerve. We, must, we may damage the olfaction. So this is my, my impression. Is, uh, this is a final uh, decision for me. Unilateral approach. We must keep the olfaction intact. I transact the uh, ipsilateral olfactory nerve path and I dissect the contralateral this is a key issue. In some cases, if I use a frontolateral approach, patient loss olfaction. Olfaction is very important to enjoy Japanese cuisine, like uh, sushi, also for important to enjoy the Indian cuisine. Yeah? It's a spice meal needs a good olfaction. So I want to show my, my uh, typical cases by frontal craniotomy, orbitotomy, this is, uh, if you familiar to approach craniotomy, just uh, 30 minutes required. And if the tumor extends laterally, we add some uh, temporal craniotomy if the tumor is large. So this is uh, my schematic drawing. Uh, Contralateral approach is used to dissect the olfactory nerve, and then mainly ipsilateral subfrontal approach used after transaction of the olfactory nerve. If the tumor large, I dissect the interhemisphere fissure. If the ACOM complex involved, I recommend to do the interhemisphere approach. So in the subfrontal approach, if you like to open the optic canal, or faculty nerve running over the optic nerve and the canal. So we must damage this nerve. That is why I intentionally cut the ipsilateral or faculty nerve. And control the other side, I carefully dissect the olfactory nerve, and then we can open the, the optic nerve as well. This is the opening of the optic nerve, it's the lateral side, control the other side, like this. Always I access to the region along the, the bigger side, infected side. Opening the optic nerve is very important, much important than opening canal is 
transaction of falciform ligament. This is a, like knife, knife. You know, if you pull the tumor laterally, it olfact, uh, falciform ligament cut the olfact, uh, optic nerve. So this is the first case. This is a relatively small case. I use a front lateral approach in this case because small. I want to show this case. This is a front lateral approach, typical case. Optic nerve located between tumor and the surgeon. On the way to the tumor, we must uh, mobilize the uh, optic nerve. We must open the optic nerve. I'm a scar based surgeon. It is uh, uh, easy for me and uh, you must uh, use a, a good drill system. Fortunately, this is a very soft tumor, very soft, easy to remove. I'm so lucky. So, and uh, of course, we must coagulate. So, aim of the operation is total resection. I'm uh, uh, involved in skull based meningioma surgery. Tubercle cell meningioma is most of the case, total resection is possible. So radical rejection is important. We must coagulate the attachment. And this is a final stage operation. This is a very, very soft. If the tumor is hard, this approach doesn't work well. We may damage the optic nerve. So this is a final stage operation. So next case, uh, relatively uh, medial side of the tuberculosis cell meningioma, patient uh, op vision is intact nearly intact. So this is uh, my bifrontal approach. Uh, this is a dissection of the olfactory nerve in the lateral side. Importance is debulk the tumor at the center of the tumor. Debulk, debulk, debulk. And then open the optic canal and transecting the first from fold. And we continue to remove the tumor. Every dissection is lateral to medial side after debulking of tumor. We should never push the uh, olfactory nerve, uh, optic nerve laterally. So this is a, uh, we have a wide space, so we can keep the, any kind of perforator intact. This is very important. So this is an approach from the lateral side. Right side, if the lateral of tumor is dissected from the optic nerve. This is a very important step. And tumor dissect from the optic canal, and this is the opening of the optic canal in the contralateral side. Olfactory nerve, you know, this is olfactory nerve must be kept intact. So this is final stage of the operation, so Attachment is drilled. This is a Simpson grade one operation. So this outcome, tumor totally rejected. This is another case. So tumor a little bit involving the ACOM complex. This is a unilateral bifrontal craniotomy. I mainly use the right side. This is a right optic nerve. Optic nerve must be identified early stage in the operation, and decompression is performed at the center of the tumor. This is the most important state. And then I open the optic canal, and all kind of uh, uh, procedure from lateral to medial. Don't push the optic nerve. And opening the uh, optic canal, and uh, I move to the next case. This is a relatively large tuberculosis cell meningioma. This is involving the ACOM compress. I use interhemispheric approach. This is a right frontal lobe, left frontal lobe, and the uh, interhemispheric fissure is dissected. This is a left handed person. This is a Dr. Goto. Uh, we operating for over 20 years. So this is a base of the skull, right side, left side and the debulking performed at the center of the tumor. This is an important step. This is a huge one. After the compression, we start to open the optic canal in, on the left side. This is optic nerve on the left side. This is a wide view, very wide view. This is a light A1 here, light A1 here, and this is a light A2, 
left A2, and A com complex is totally involved by tumor. So this is a uh, some tumor left behind around the A com complex. This is a final outcome. So this is a small piece of tumor left behind. I followed this case 10 years, no recurrence at all, because the tumor is completely devascularized. This is outcome. So patient vision improved. Uh, this is uh, my unforgettable case. Unforgettable case, this is uh, ACOM, A1 is envelope. This is uh, my chronotomy. So this is a orbital, periorbital expose. And this is a, a superior sagittal sinus is transected as anterior as possible. This is a control lateral olfactory nerve, carefully dissected, carefully, carefully dissected. Left olfactory Nav is uh, preserved completely. So something wrong, so let me move to the this one. In this case, I want to show you is Okay, I want to show you is, in this case, I injure the optic canal, uh, uh, carotid artery. I injure the carotid artery by QSA because tum this is patient has arteriosclerosis, so internal carotid artery uh, projecting medial side. This is a repaired carotid artery right here. I, I clip the uh, carotid artery on the peripheral and the proximal side and I repair it. So this is a very uh, important finding if we, we like to use an endoscope for this particular region, if the, we injure the uh, internal carotid artery, there's no, no way to repair the internal carotid artery in the endoscope. So this is another case, it's a small, relatively small one. This is a very small one, but in the, on the right side, small tuberculum cell and extend over the optic canal. So this is an advantage of the transcranial approach. We can remove the old tumor above the optic nerve. So next my interest, this is outcome. This is another case of diagonal cellular meningioma. This is a particular meningioma. This, this is a different from tuberculous cellular meningioma. This is a attachment is a diagonal cellular. And this is a tumor. Tumor looks uh, similar to the tuberculous cellular meningioma. And I start to remove the tumor uh, by QSA. And this is a right-sided, right uh, optic nerve. But there is a very, very tight adhesion between tumor and optic nerve because diagonal cellular meningioma arise from the, the same system in, of the optic nerve. So there's no alacrylate membrane in between the tumor and optic nerve. There is a very, very tight adhesion. So this is uh, important knowledge for us. This is, uh, I try to dissect the tumor from the optic nerve, but it's uh, impossible. I operate this case three times and finally send uh, this patient to the gamma knife unit. This is very tight adhesion. So diagonal cellular meningioma is different entity. The stalk here, right optic nerve, stalk is very uh, adhered by the tumor. Total rejection is impossible in this case. This is outcome. So this is our clinical outcome. So total rejection achieves 27 cases among 34 cases. And this is analysis of uh, visual function 
uh, 31 cases, I performed the grade one surgery, 27, nearly Simpson grade one to surgery. So importance is uh, visual function. So 90% of patients show the improvement of the visual function. So I carefully dissect uh, any uh, perforator from the A1 complex. So patient shows the improvement of, of the vision even one year later. So optic uh, visual function gradually, gradually improves for the one year. This is the advantage of the transcranial approach. We can carefully uh, preserve the uh, perforators. This is the outcome. So post long follow-up period, patient has an improvement. What is the role of the endoscope? So I would, I, in order to know the use of endoscope, we must be uh, know the uh, invasion, extent of the invasion of the tumor before the operation. So I analyzed 31 cases and uh, we review the intraoperative video and as a radiologist check the uh, blind prediction of preoperative MRI to know if characteristics of the tumor invasion is predictable uh, from the preoperative MRI. This is our uh, grading system. Type one is just a no invasion. Type two is a secondary invasion to optic canal. Uh, grade three is uh, invasion to two wall. And this is a superior wall, medial wall invasion. The type four is a three wall invasion. And uh, this is uh, analysis outcome. Only one case has a no tumor invasion to optic canal. So most of the case invades optic canal, unilateral side in the tw 21 case uh, side, and bilateral tumor invades uh, in nine case. So this is type one. So surprisingly, type three, this is a tumor invading above on the optic canal, and type four also invading above the optic canal. This is a 30% of the tumor extend on the optic nerve and the canal. It's meaning we, if we use the endoscope surgery, we must leave, leave the this part, leave the left part behind. This is very important. So, and the blind prediction of the tumor invasion was, accuracy was just success rate is 61%. We fail in 40%. We cannot uh, pre uh, predict the tumor in, uh, invasiveness before the operation. This is very important, so that this is our current uh, 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 flow chart to operate on the uh, tuberculosis cell meningioma. Of course, interhemisk front basal approach is the basic approach, and if the tumor is small and limited between the uh, both optic nerve, we select the eyebrow endoscopic approach, and the tumor is located diagnosis cell. This is a special type. We use an endoscopic approach just for the decompression of the optic nerve. I want to show the case. So I want to show some uh, selected case. This is a relatively small tumor. So tumor is located small, looks small. So 40 uh, years old male. We use the eyebrow approach on the right side. So to, this is a optic nerve. So we already removed the tuberculosis cell for the purpose of the grade one operation. This is a forehand operation, Dr. Goto operating for me. And uh, this is a relatively uh, soft tumor. So eyebrow, this is a minimal invasive approach, but uh, we must close uh, uh, sinus, it might, sinus, it might uh, when the sinus is opened, we must close this part. So this is outcome. So if the tumor is small, we may use the uh, uh, eyebrow endoscopic approach. This is outcome. We use this uh, approach in the five case, uh, seven cases, and the outcome is uh, very good. This is a transcranial approach, transcranial. That's why we can remove the tumor on the optic canal and uh, nerve. This is the advantage of the transcranial approach. Of course, 
if the tumor involving the ACOM complex is very dangerous. And we, we must know the anatomy of the internal carotid artery in advance. If the uh, carotid artery projecting medial side, th this is very dangerous. You must be carefully dissect the tumor from the optic nerve, uh, nerve and the internal carotid artery. This is outcome. Outcome is, is really good. This is a uh, last case. This is a 47-year-old male. This is a uh, relatively large diagonal meningioma. Attachment is diagonal and we need the uh, early decompression of the tumor because of pa patient losing the uh, unilateral of, uh, optic function. So and uh, so right side also uh, deteriorating. We select this uh, endoscopic endonasal approach. In this case, we use the uh, posterior crinoidectomy approach. This is a uh, schematic drawing of the disoperation. So we publish this data to the journal of neurosurgery. This is a uh, posterior crinoidal process. If you remove the process, we can have a uh, uh, double uh, wider uh, space in around the uh, brainstem. This is also the posterior crinoidectomy uh, schematic drawing. After the crinoidectomy, we can gain the wider space. This is uh, actually epidural approach to the center of the skull base. This is not a transcavernous approach. This is a con con uh, illustration. This is a standard transfemoral approach. If we open the, take off the posterior cranial process, uh, we can have a wider space. This is operation. So, uh, uh, cellular flow is uh, opened, and this is a part of Krybus, and the uh, flow of the cellular is opened. And then, uh, this is a uh, uh, dura opened as a midline. In this moment, feeder was nicely coagulated, so there's no bleeding from the tumor. This is the advantage of the uh, endoscopic approach, and fortunately, tumor is soft, and we continue to uh, start the debulking of the tumor. And uh, this is, uh, you know, we, of course, use a navigation system as well. This is a frontal side, this is a op uh, optic nerve here. So this is a uh, uh, surgeon need a uh, uh, very meticulous uh, dissection technique. This is also a forehand technique. Uh, assistant uh, uh, protects the internal carotid artery. This is a vagina artery. Uh, this is a post, uh, SCA and PCA visualized, nicely visualized. In this case, uh, well demarcated, but uh, this is a uh, perforator. So, because of the four-handed approach, we can preserve this small artery. So, this is uh, this uh, type of tumor is so difficult to uh, access through the transcranial approach. Sometimes we use a transpetrous approach, but uh, this is uh, you know. Uh, now we have a good instrument, so maybe one of the selection is endoscope en of endonasal approach. This is optic chiasma here. This is a floor of the uh, fourth ventricle, uh, third ventricle there, and the final piece is tumor left behind, uh, uh, removed. This is a uh, oculomotor nerve. And this is final stage of oper operation. So in this uh, particular case, we close uh, the, uh, the base of the dura defect. It's uh, nicely uh, closed. This is uh, also uh, presented in the journal. This is a uh, fisherman's technique. So this is a special technique. It's uh, working so nice. It's very important to uh, close the dura as a deep part. So this is a final stage of the suture. 
we close the DURA successfully. This is a final stage of operation. Uh, this is a uh, case is uh, operated by endoscopic endonasal approach. We use uh, 10 cases. Outcome is so far quite good. Of course, we must uh, protect the CSF leakage. We need a further impro improvement of this technique. This is a table of the endoscopic endonasal approach. This is a goal. So outcome is very satisfactory. Now, this is a uh, schematic drawing to show them our concept. This is a uh, meningioma arising from the primary swelling area or swelling cellar. It's across uh, the optic canal. If you use the uh, endoscopic approach, some part left behind, as, as mentioned in the first part of this talk. So, and then this is an uh, endoscopic approach. This is a conceptually, it's a good approach if the tumor is small. And the tumor origin from the diagonal cellar and the diagonal cellar and the tumor cellar and the tumor, uh, th this kind of tumor pushes the optic nerve in from the inferior side. So that is why we can remove the tumor around the optic nerve. So this is an important uh, concept. So this is a surgery for the tumor diagonal cellar meningioma. This is the aim, of course, in the last case, some tumor left behind around the margin of the tumor. We must be carefully observe that case. This is a conclusion. So, so now, before the uh, advent of the endoscope, I prefer to use a transcranial bifrontal approach. Now, some case, circuit case, could be removed by the endoscopic approach. Thank you very much for your attention. I request our director, Dr. Pratima Murthy, Dr. B. A. Chandramoli, sir, and Dr. Dwarkana, sir, to kindly felicitate our speaker, Dr. Kenji Ohata. Small announcement, delegates kindly avail their membership uh, before tomorrow 12 noon to be considered for award papers. So moving on from one stalwart to another, I would request Dr. Uh, Venkatesh Madhugiri sir to kindly introduce our next uh, speaker, Professor Atul Goel. Good evening. Um, it's my pleasure and privilege and slightly daunting task to have been called upon to introduce Professor Atul Goel. Uh, Dr. Dwarkanath said to me, and I agree with him, that Dr. Goel doesn't need any introduction. So then the question arises as to what I was supposed to say. So I have some rather uh, dull and boring slides that will serve the purpose uh, of just saying a few things about him. But I think I, I thought I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit about what I know of him as a person. So Professor Atul Goel, as we know, he's been the chair of the department at KEM. 
what many of us don't know is that he was also the person who started neurosurgery, neuro-oncology services at uh, TMH in Mumbai, much before an alumnus of this institute, Dr. Ali, joined there. And he continues to remain associated with Tata Memorial Hospital in a very active capacity. And his guidance and mentorship has always been there for neuro-oncology services at TMH, which probably explains why they have risen to the height that they have risen to. He is an honorary consultant neurosurgeon at Leelawati in Mumbai, and he's also a consultant neurosurgeon to the governor of the state. Um, Professor Goel has been the president of NSI, we know that. He's also been the past president of uh, the Asia Oceana Skull Based Surgery Society. Uh, I remember when uh, Dr. Goel organized the uh, AOSBS Society uh, conference in Mumbai. So I had submitted a paper about, uh, about some of my work there and uh, I was the, so to speak, opening batsman. I think my paper was on the first day, the first talk. And I got there to the hall, and I don't know if uh, Dr. Abida remembers this. There were exactly three of us in the hall, myself, Dr. Goel, and Dr. Abida. And uh, I was wondering what to do. And then Dr. Goel said, you start. And uh, I started, and then I realized that this was probably, I was probably worse off than if the hall had been packed, because his undivided attention was on my paper. And there was actually a little bit of a grilling after I finished my talk. But then I realized with what keenness he had listened to the talk and the penetrating questions that he asked. And we had a wonderful discussion on my talk on the posterior fossa after that. I'm sure sir doesn't remember, but that's something I've never forgotten. And uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised that he was there at uh, 8 a.m. in the morning on the, of the conference. Uh, Professor Goel is an honorary member of several neurosurgical societies around the world, and they're all honored by his membership and by his presence there. Um, he has been the editor-in-chief of several journals, uh, including the Journal of Craniovertebral Junction and Spine, which is his baby as well as the International Journal of Neurology and Neurosurgery, and he continues to be on the editorial board of the Asian Journal. Uh, he's also been the editor of the Postgraduate Medicine Journal and of Neurology India, most importantly. And the number of journals that are privileged to have him on their editorial boards is probably too many to count, and this is not even a complete list. I just ran out of space on the slide. Uh, he's been the recipient of several awards, and I have actually focused on those that I felt were important, because the ICMR awards that he received twice were for outstanding research, and that goes to tell us that he was as much of a researcher as he was a surgical innovator. And most importantly, he's received the Dr. B.C. Roy National Award, and that tells us about his love for teaching, and uh, ask any of his residents, and they'll attest to his love for teaching residents. And uh, he's also received an award from the mayor of Mumbai for his services to neurosurgery. This is more recent, and this is something that I thought we should uh, share here, and there are a few researchers who've been featured on John Ioannidis uh, list of the top 2% of researchers in the world. And John Ioannidis is a very respected scientometrist, and he compiled a list of the top 2% of researchers across all scientific disciplines around the world, and uh, prominently figure in them, figuring in them from India, and I'm afraid uh, it's too small, I realized it very late. Figuring prominently in this list is Professor Atul Goel. So he is actually in the top 2% of scientists from all disciplines around the world. And I would like to take a moment to congratulate him for, the, for this outstanding accomplishment. Um, this is a picture of uh, Sir, Ma'am, and his daughter. Ma'am is here, she's a neuropathologist, and uh, she keeps him on the straight and narrow path, as all pathologists do to surgeons. Uh, the other thing that I want to say about Goel is that I had the privilege and pleasure of interacting with him in a personal capacity when I was in uh, TMH. And I can tell you that uh, as penetrating as his remarks about surgery and surgical techniques are, his questions about neuro-oncology, especially molecular neuro-oncology, are even more difficult to answer. I don't know whether he comes and asks us the questions that he's afraid to ask, ma'am or whether he's just testing us with the knowledge, but it was very, very difficult to, to, to uh, discuss or argue cases with Sir about neuro-oncology. And I have to tell you how encouraging he was when I joined TMH there and how much he encouraged me to uh, continue with my passion for uh, neuro-oncology. And he has a large role to play in my remaining committed to the discipline of neuro-oncology. And therefore, it is my pleasure and absolute privilege to call upon Professor Atul Goel to deliver his talk in this conference. Sir. Thank you, Venkatesh, for that elaborate uh, information about me. 
First of all, I want to thank Dr. Dwarka, Dr. Indira Devi to allow me to give this oration in front of my, in honor of my most loved and most respected Dr. B.S. Das. Can I have my slides? Since the Skull Bay Society was formed, I have given, always I have talked in this society and always I have talked on cavernous silence. But today I have decided to talk on the subject, Maruna. Just check. Today I have decided to talk on a subject which, which is absolute. And I am going to talk to you on an absolute revolution in spine. A complete revolution. Change in the concept. So better be ready and better be sitting straight and tight. So this presentation of mine is in loving memory of Dr. B.S. Das, who has inspired a generation of neurosurgeons. His work, his contributions, and his affection, particularly towards me, are things which I admire and I love, and I want to talk about the work that he liked. So the whole world of spine the issue is compression. You talk of compression, and the treatment is decompression. So that is spine. I want to take you away from decompression. And I want to introduce to you a concept which may look absolutely radical and absolutely different to you. Compression is never an issue. Compression is never primary. Compression is always secondary. Compression is always protective. And compression is always reversible. So on this premise, I will take you further. The most important surgical issue is that decompression I'm not talking of only craniovertebral junction. I'm talking of the entire spine. Decompression is never the treatment. The issue of human body is that we have standing position like no other animal on the planet. The issue of human body is our entire musculature is located on the back of our spine. Not a single muscle is related to the disc. Very few fibers are related to the body. I wish to give you a concept that disc can never go wrong. Disc is never an issue. The mus muscle of the whole body are focused on the facets. Weakness of these muscles is the issue. When these muscles become weak, there is a manifestation of that weakness on the facets by listhesis. It may be microlysthesis or it may be major listhesis. This listhesis in an acute stage is all right, but in chronic situation, is not recognizable on radiographs, dynamic or non-dynamic. I wish to introduce to you a beautiful new concept of vertical facetal instability. Is it the point of degeneration? If you see the entire journals of last one century, whenever you talk of degeneration, you talk of the disc going wrong, this water reduction, I'm saying that disc is not the issue. It is vertical telescoping of the spine. You see, if your grandfather is shorter than you, because his spine has telescoped, this telescoping due to weakness of the muscle is the issue. 
This kind of listhesis as a cause of basilar invagination, like lumbosacral listhesis, this is due to weakness of the muscles. C1 over C2 listhesis is the cause of basilar invagination. We talked about it in 1999. Listhesis is the issue and instability is the, is the problem. Basilar invagination was treated by treatment of instability and craniovertebral junction realignment. There was no decompression. So this concept is now very well accepted in the world. And most of the people who are doing craniovertebral junction will not do transoral surgery or posterior decompression. Craniovertebral realignment is the treatment. Transoral decompression is completely, without any doubt or hesitation, historical operation. In chronic situation, atlantoaxial instability, one is acute. The symptoms are pain, stiffness of neck, and all those things. But in chronic situation, nature comes into picture. Adaptive maneuvering comes into picture. And we have to understand what happens in chronic situations. When there is chronic atlantoaxial instability, the nature tries to prevent the disability, the neural disability, by introducing several issues, like shortening of the neck, torticollis, clipple file abnormality, C2-3 fusion, bifid, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, they may be present in discreetly or in cohort, like Chiari may present with syringe, Chiari may be present with basilar invagination. So all these are secondary, all these are protective, and all these are reversible. And currently, the whole world thinks that these are pathological, and the whole world treats this anomaly by decompression. They are not primary, they are secondary, they are protective, and they are all reversible. Treatment is atlantoaxial stabilization. So we introduce a beautiful concept of central or axial atlantoaxial instability, which may not be manifested on radiographs, but it is unstable. It is unstable but may cause only marginal deficit because nature is in picture. It, cause, it, it manifests by Chiari, by syringomyelia, by spinal degeneration, by spinal spondylosis, by OPLL, by Hiramaya disease. The whole world treats these anomalies by decompression. The issue is understanding the concept of central or axial atlantoaxial instability. Carefully see these slides. So this kind of listhesis we talked about in 1999. Atlantodental interval disturbance, the only validated parameter of atlantoaxial instability, compression, the treatment is stabilization. Everybody now agrees to this concept. Now you see this slide, there is basilar invagination, there is no compression, there is no atlantodental interval disturbance. But if you carefully see the facets are malaligned, retrolysthesis problem is weakness or injury or disuse of the muscles. Instability is the issue. Stabilization is the treatment. I have to tell you, the whole world today will treat by decompression, which is an absolutely negative operation. Another beautiful concept is even when the facets are in alignment, even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, Chiari malformation, syringomyelia, platybasia, assimilation of atlas, C2-3 fusion are all secondary manifestations. They are protective maneuvering and they are all reversible. So basilar invagination Instability is the issue and stabilization is the treatment. There is absolutely no role of decompression in both group A and group B and we have got thousands, more than thousands of these patients and we have no controversy or confusion about it. Basilar invagination, syringomyelia, Chiari malformation are all children of atlantoaxial instability. They are all looking up to their father. They are all protective and they can run away when the father is treated properly. So we introduced this article, whether atlantoaxial instability is the cause of carry malformation and atlantoaxial fixation is the treatment. There is no doubt or confusion, and those who have doubt, they have to just walk towards Mumbai. 
So there is Chiari malformation, seringomyelia, no atlantodental interval disturbance. Look at the facets, they may be unstable. Stabilization is the treatment and magic is the clinical outcome. And magic is the radiological outcome. There is absolutely no role for decompression whether the facets are in al al alignment or not. Whether there is minimum malalignment or not, there is only one treatment and treatment is C1, C2 fixation, and the answer is magic. And answer is absolute without confusion. Even when there is no atlantodental interval disturbance, even when there is no facetal malalignment, presence of Chiari is an indicator of atlantoaxial instability. This tight posterior fossa concept was introduced by me in 1998. I am saying my concept was wrong. And we have got now hundreds of patients where syringomyelia has disappeared. I give you one statement. Syringomyelia will reduce in 100% of patients, 100% if you do after scan after six months. And the patient will improve 100% if you see him in the evening of operation. And there is no confusion. Don't keep any doubt about this. We recently published this series of 388 cases. And you please see the beauty of the results. Whenever carry mal, whenever you do foramen, I was doing foramen magnum decompression for a long time. I was the one who described that there is no need to open the dura. Several of my patients have come back for fixation. This patient was treated 13 times by various kinds of shunts and decompressions and all those things. I treated this thing, a student of IIT, his back in IIT. When he came to me, he was having a nasal tube, he was having a tracheostomy, he was having a urinary catheter, he was on the wheelchair, his back on his IIT student. So Chiari is secondary, Chiari is protective, Chiari is reversible, Chiari is an indicator of unstable spine. Syringomyelia is helpful, it is not harmful, it is reversible, it is indicator of unstable spine. Idiopathic syrinx, nobody in the world knows what to do. But the issue is, this is secondary, whether it is present with carry or without carry, whether, whether it is present with bone malformations or no, the issue is C1, C2 instability. Cervical fusions are secondary, they are protective, and they are potentially reversible. When you see cervical fusion, the problem is not here. The whole world today will do decompression. I am saying this is not the issue. The problem is here. You can give absolutely new life to this lady. Bifid is secondary and protective and reversible. When you see bifid and when there is no compression, don't worry about compression. Forget about compression. It's a non-entity in neurosurgery and in spine surgery. When you see bifid, when you see bone fusion, you do C1, C2 fixation. When you see osodontodium, whether there is anything else or not, whether the patient is symptomatic or not, there is one treatment. These are protective. These are secondary, and these are reversible. Short neck, short head, short spine are all secondary. You treat C1, C2, you make kings out of these patients. All these secondary musculoskeletal abnormalities like short neck torticollis are reversible following stabilization. And we have got hundreds of examples. No need to get confused and don't have arguments and discussions. You create kings. Another thing, the problem will not be here. The problem can be remote. Kyphoscoliosis, believe me my dear friends, kyphoscoliosis in this age group. In 80% of patients, the problem is not here. Don't stabilize here. The problem is central or atlantoaxial instability. You treat this, you identify it, treat it, and see the magic. So central or axial instability is a manifestation by itself. Then when you see syrinx, when you see bifid, even when there is no compression, the treatment is C1, C2 fixation. So in my estimation, foramen magnum decompression is an absolute historical operation. Now I lead you to another magic. Are you ready to hear this magic? Anterior cervical surgery, the whole world of spinal surgery is doing decompressions from front. I was doing a lot of these decompression to the extent that I was invited to write a chapter in the most famous Sweet and Smidek book, and here is my chapter. I was doing this kind of fixations for a long time. I was doing osteophyte removal for a long time. I introduced these tricortical screws for the first time and these are quite popular today, but I don't do this. I want to introduce to you 
a different world of spinal spondylosis. The whole world talks of disc. I am saying disc is divine. Disc is protective. Disc can never go wrong. The problem is you, because you have not taken care of your muscles, and the weakness is manifested at the facets. Degenerative arthro arthritis of craniovertebral junction, nobody in the world has ever discussed. So this was my article for the first time in the literature. I have to give you this information, that when we talk of degeneration, we talk of C5, C6, C6, 7. Never we talk of C1, C2. I give you one information that C1, C2 instability and C1, C2 degeneration is the most common, is the most neglected, is the most undertreated degeneration in spine. And when we get bad results, we blame our technique. We blame this. We don't blame our misunderstanding of C1, C2. I want you to see, ladies and gentlemen, beautifully this slide, and carefully this slide. Reduction in the, inter, in the joint space. Buckling of posterior longitudinal ligament, osteophyte formation. These are not primary events. They are not the issue. They are secondary, they are protective, and they are reversible. There is no need for any kind of decompression here. When you see ossification of the apical ligament, osteophyte here, osteophyte here, they are not primary. They are secondary. They are protective and they are reversible. Issue is they indicate unstable spine. You do C1, C2 fixation and you see a magic. A magic which you will never see by decompression. Retroodontoid pseudotumor, the whole world was doing decompression by transoral surgery. For the first time in literature we introduced that this is not a tumor. This is like an osteophyte. This is secondary, this is protective. And this is reversible by atlantoaxial stabilization. There is no need to do any primary surgery for this. And many people in the world are following this concept, but not many in Western world still. Retroodontoid cyst. It is very easy to remove the cyst. But if you understand that instability is the issue, you stabilize, instability will disappear as soon as in the immediate post-operative period. And we have got several examples where this simple cyst we have not touched and it has disappeared. And I had written this article, those who will be interested, please, rather than arguing and thinking and saying this and that, please read some of these beautiful articles. Retroodontoid panus, rheumatoid, the whole world of craniovertebral junction was doing transoral surgery to remove this panus. For the first time in the literature, we said it is due to vertical collapse, and this panus is not a problem. You stabilize panus will disappear as early as immediate post-operative period. And we introduced several, several cases like this. We introduced the art of intra-articular distraction for the first time. We introduced intra-articular spacers for the first time for craniovertebral junction, and these are my spacers. But we never talk of subaxial facetal distraction. About 15 years ago, like C1, C2 instability, facetal instability can be present. This may not be. This will not be identifiable on dynamic imaging. But these are unstable. If you see an osteophyte, this is the problem. If you see a bulging disc, this instability is the problem. Disc is not the issue. Carefully see this slide. Reduction in the interbody space. Bulging of this disc, bulging of this disc are not the issue. They are not a problem. They are protective. They are reversible. And they are natural gifts. They, have not, they are not pathologies. The whole world today treats them as pathology. I am saying they are indicators of unstable spine. You stabilize and see the magic. Vertical instability is the issue and it is point of genesis of spinal spondylosis. So we introduced these spacers about 15 years ago, intra-articular spacers, and you see these are immediate results. Buckling is gone, ligamentum flavum buckling is gone, and most importantly, the patient recover, recovers dramatically. A word drama, a word magic is not, is a little bit egoistic to say, but take it from me. So we have got many patients where we have not done decompression. We have done only distraction arthrodesis, and you can see some of these images where the disc has formed and the bulging have gone. 
So this was published as cover page of Journal of Neurosurgery and a and many people in the world are following this concept. And this is the rationale of an alternative hypothesis. So these were my spaces. And there are many, uh, you see the beauty, multi-segmental, there is no decompression. And you see the post-operative, beautiful, unbelievable. Is, that is one thing. So same concept, I got into lumbar canal stenosis. The whole world calls it stenosis. The whole world treats it as decompression. I am saying it is not stenosis. It is vertical collapse. It is vertical instability. You treat by these kind of distractors. So decompression of compressed and deformed neural structures is the basis of surgical treatment for all spine surgeons of the world. I said that you do only fixation for spinal spondylosis. And we recently produced this article. And you see, read between the lines, and you will get beautiful information. You see in World Neurosurgery this article. The title is, Muscle Weakness Related Spinal is is Instability is the Cause of Spinal Degeneration. And only spinal stabilization is the treatment. This is in World Neurosurgery. Now carefully see this slide. No need for anterior surgery, no need for corpectomy, which is an absolute negative operation. No need to remove these bulges and the disc. You do only stabilization. And you see after 12 months, you see the magic. And on the first day, you see the magic with the patient. A magic which you have never seen in your life when you do decompression. You see multi-segmental stenosis. And you see after a period of time, there is no decompression, only fixation, not even distraction. So degenerative myelopathy, we should look with a different eye. Instability is the cause of symptoms and stabilization is the treatment. Neural deformation, neural compression is never an issue. So I use this camelase transarticular technique, which is most beautiful. Most important thing in treatment of spinal degeneration is one, identify which levels are unstable. This is the most tricky situation. Now you carefully see this slide, there are two level of issues, and I have done four level of fixation, and you see this patient. Why I have done four level of fixation? You please read this article, how to identify what levels are unstable and what levels to fix, essentially, Fixation is the treatment, not decompression. You see another beautiful example. Where is the controversy? There is no controversy. There is no discussion or argument. Fixation is the treatment. Decompression be, can be a negative treatment. Another fantastic thing I'm introducing to you for the first time in the literature. When we talk of degeneration, we never talk of Atlanta action. I am giving you this statement. When there is severe degeneration, severe myelopathy, C1, C2 instability is very common and neglected and untreated. And you see this article where I have said atlantoaxial instability. Even when there is no compression, you see the facets may be malalignment. Even if the facets are aligned, they may be unstable. And they are unstable in severe myelopathy. You have to include C1, C2 in your fixation construct. When the patient comes with severe myelopathy, more often than not, atlantoaxial instability is associated. You read this article, you read this article, 60 patients of mine came on a wheelchair and in one month of follow-up, at least 40 were walking. So this is not arbitrary or something like this. This is real and this is the future, whether you take it or whether you do not take it. So we have introduced an alternative C1, C2 fixation where we do not include C1. This is the article on that. So this is multi-segmental. There is no need for anterior decompression. There is no need for posterior decompression. You do camelase technique of fixation and you see the magic. What is the harm? Suppose you fail, you can come from and front or from midline. There is all, everything is open and you have already done the fixation. I have never required to redo my operation ever. So this multi-degeneration, you do fixation by camelase technique, you do one screw, two screw. Same concept, same issue, lumbar canal stenosis. It is not a stenosed canal, it is an unstable canal. You see this article of mine, these are not statements which I'm just making in front of you. These are all heavily published. More than 100 articles of mine are in literature. You see this in neurosurgical focus where I say that lumbar canal stenosis analyzing the role of stabilization and futility of decompression. So lumbar canal stenosis, if you really ask me, 
the whole world will put endoscope from here and endoscope from here and some will put from here. It is not necessary. What is required is do a good fixation, identify. You see, maybe here you are not seeing any compression, but it is unstable. So I, these are indicators of unstable spine. These are secondary and these are protective. And we have got several patients where we have treated without any form of decompression and we have got several publications. So is it necessary to remove the osteophytes? Is it necessary? I am saying it is not necessary. The whole spine surgery is focused on one issue, to remove the osteophytes. And the whole spine surgery is focused on the issue to decompress, to accommodate the osteophyte. I am saying osteophytes are divine. Do not touch them. You fix the problem, and that problem is from behind. There is, these osteophytes will spontaneously bow in front of you and disappear. And we have got several patients which I, I am showing you. So degenerative spine stenosis is a misnomer. Deformities of spine. If you read the literature on spine, I know many of you are skull based, you don't want to think about spine like I used to never think about spine, I've never talked about spine, now I'm talking. Deformities, the whole world does deformity correction by kyphectomy, by osteotomy, I'm saying not necessary. Deformities are secondary. Deformities are, are protective. Identify which levels are unstable, like in this patient C1, C2 should be done, nothing else. In this patient, there is central instability. You have to include C1, C2. This patient, you have to identify. So identification of the level, kyphectomy and bone resection, this is not necessary. I wish to introduce, my dear friends, another beautiful, probably a magical concept to you, that prolapsed disc, prolapsed disc is not a problem. It is natural protection. It is an indicator of unstable spine. Either unstable spine causes disc herniation or disc herniation causes an unstable spine. Instability is the issue. When you give collar means you are stabilizing the spine. When you give belt, you are stabilizing the spine. Stabilized by surgery. Don't have to touch the disc. And it is very heavily published, this concept of mine, that this simple operation, ACDF, which the whole world will like to do, I am saying it is not necessary. You do fixation, this disc will disappear. Most importantly, the patient will improve remarkably. So this was my article in World Neurosurgery, where I said that fascicle fixation arthrodesis is necessary. Lumbar disc, this is my article, where I am saying only fixation is necessary for disc. There is no need to remove the disc. And you see, you just think about it, it is a magic. When you give belt, the pain goes many of the times. You don't need to operate because this resolves. If you stabilize internally, the matter is closed for good. So this lumbar, lumbar degeneration and scoliosis. I treated the president of one country. This is the image not of the president, but another similar patient. The whole world will treat by decompression. I am saying this scoliosis is not a primary issue. This is an indicator of multi-segmental instability. I have stabilized and I am the chief guest of this country for life. And I enjoy the hospitality of this president and I am really enjoying it. Another magical thing, last issue I'm going to tell you, there are several small, small tricks with me I can discuss with you for length at some other occasion. But last and the foremost, ossification of posterior longitudinal ligament, nobody in the world knows how to treat it, nobody. And if anybody in the audience has done more than five cases, and if he says in the five cases, I have not got a sing one patient with complication, I will say you are saying lies. Decompression for OPLL is an absolutely dangerous operation. OPLL is an indicator of unstable spine. For the first time in the literature, I introduced this term oblique corpectomy. I was doing corpectomies for a long time, although I didn't talk about it, but I have published a lot. So this was the first paper where oblique corpectomy was discussed. Now I am saying OPLL is a manifestation of unstable spine. OPLL patients are different. If you see OPLL patient, they are huge. Only stabilization is the treatment. And only magic is the clinical outcome, magic. A magic which you will not realize. 
I will just get, give you one incident. Yesterday, I was talking to one patient of mine during on phone, and on phone at least 15 times he said, you are my God, you are my God. I don't become God like this, but I become happy and absolutely happy that this concept is here to stay. Whether you agree or not, that is upon you. And this kind of complex OPLL, don't do decompression from front, don't do decompression from behind. Identify the unstable segments. Identify which segments are unstable and do a very simple operation. I do five level fixation, believe me my friends. I do five or six levels stabilization in 15 minutes. Exposure is done, I go and just quickly, and this is such a strong, facets are the strongest part of the human spine. Facetal screws are the strongest purchase any spine can give you. And this fixation is wonderful. Another fantastic thing, my dear friends, atlantoaxial instability is very frequently associated in OPLL along with subaxial spinal instability. You have to include atlantoaxial joint in your fixation construct. If you do not include, you can have a failure. Then don't blame your rongers, don't blame your drills, don't blame anything, blame yourself because you have not understood the problem. So atlantoaxial instability is very frequently associated, I am saying, can this revolutionize the treatment of OPLL? Absolutely. It has already revolutionized and the magic is done. So this is the technique I sometimes introduce, two screws, three screws. Can decompressive laminectomy for degenerative lumbar and cervical spinal stenosis become historical? Yes. Is instability the nodal point of pathogenesis of bold cervical spine, cervical spondylotic myelopathy and OPLL? My answer is yes. Like transoral decompression, anterior surgery will soon find history books. These kind of decompressions can become futile and nonsense. I should not word this because there are very beautiful people sitting. I want to be very, you know, nice to you and nice to myself. I should not use these kind of words. But I'm saying from only decompression to only fixation, this is my article. Atlantoaxial and subaxial fixation can revolutionize the treatment of OPLL. My dear friends, compression is never an issue for the whole spine. I'm not talking of tumors. Compression is not an issue and decompression is not a treatment. Thank you very much. I request Professor B. Indra Devi, Professor Sampath Somanna, uh, Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas, sir, to kindly facilitate our speaker. Just a gentle reminder, um, 
delegates who want to be considered for award papers kindly uh, avail the membership by tomorrow 12 noon. We'll have a small break now and uh, reassemble for inauguration at 7 p.m. sharp.
Hello, this is
Chick. Hallo. We will now begin the inauguration ceremony for the 23rd annual conference of the Skull Based Surgery Society of India. I request all the delegates to kindly take their seats. I request our organizing secretary, Professor Dwarkanath Srinivas, sir, to kindly uh, escort our chief guest, Dr. G. N. Narayan Reddy, sir, our guest of honor, Dr. Pratima Moti, ma'am, the president, Skull Based Society of India, Dr. Rajnish Kachara, secretary, Skull Based Society of India, Dr. Ashish Suri, organizing chair, Dr. Pro B. Indra Devi, to kindly come on the stage. Now begin with the soulful rendition of the invocation song by Dr. Pratima Ayar. Vani Veena Pustaka Pani Vani Veena 
ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಪಾಣಿ ವಾಂಛಿತ ಫಲದೆ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣಿ ವಾಣಿ ವೀಣಾ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಪಾಣಿ ವಾಂಛಿತ ಫಲದೆ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣಿ ವಾಣಿ ವೀಣಾ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಪಾಣಿ ವಾಸವಿನುತೆ ಭಾಸುರ ಕಾಂತಿ ವಾಸವಿನುತೆ ಭಾಸುರ ಕಾಂತಿ ಭೂಸುರ ಪ್ರೀತಿ ಶುಭ ಚರಿತೆ ವಾಸವಿನುತೆ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಪಾಣಿ ವಾಂಛಿತ ಫಲದೆ ಕಲ್ಯಾಣಿ ವಾಣಿ ವಿವೀಣ ವಾಣಿ ವಿವೀಣ ವಾಣಿ ವಿವೀಣ ಪುಸ್ತಕ ಪಾಣಿ I now request the dignitaries on the stage to kindly light the lamp. observe a minute's silence in the to honor the memory of professor b s das i request you to kindly stand up for the minute
Thank you. I now request the organizing chair, Professor B. Indra Devi, ma'am, to kindly deliver the welcome address. Sir, class is blinking. Good evening. I am happy to welcome you, one and all, to the 23rd Annual Conference of Skull Base uh, Surgery Society of India, being hosted by the Department of Neurosurgery in Nimans, Bangalore. The organizing secretary, Dr. Uh, Dwarka Nath, Dr. K.V. Ellen Rao, along with the scientific committee led by Dr. Shukla and Dr. Priti, have uh, already engaged many of you for the last two days that is yesterday and today. The entire team of neurosurgery faculty, residents, the office staff, and the allied departments have put in a lot of effort to make your visit comfortable and fruitful. So sit back and enjoy. Thank you for being here. Welcome once again. I now request the President's Kalbe Society of India, Dr. Rajesh Kachara, to address the gathering. <coughs> Dignitaries on the dais, Dr. G. N. Narayana Reddy, former director of NIMANS, Bangalore. The guest of honor, Dr. Pratima Murthy, vice chancellor and director, NIMANS, Bangalore. Dr. B. Indra Devi, Conference Chair, Dr. Ashish Suri, Secretary of Skullbed Surgery Society of India, Dr. Dwarkanath, Organizing Secretary of the Congress. Respected teachers and friends and colleagues, national and international faculties, organizing team, students, and ladies and gentlemen. A warm welcome on behalf of Skull Base Surgery Society of India to the third annual conference at Nimans, Bangalore. It has been 24 years since its inception on 7th February 1998, when the first Congress was held in Delhi at Vigyan Bhavan by Professor A.K. Singh and it was attended in large number. I had an honor and privilege to serve the society as an activity committee member and secretary. It is now a well-established super specialty society, sub-specialty society, and we have nearly more than 600 full members, and it's growing. It's a multidisciplinary society where there are a large number of, number of ENT surgeons, head neck surgeons, maxillofacial surgeons, and they work together uh, in collaboration, particularly when now the new approaches, endoscopic skull base approaches, uh, this is in combination with ENT and neurosurgeon, they work together to get the best outcome. There are many ENT surgeons doing uh, these procedures alone, like pituitary, craniopharyngioma, and now new term also has come, ENT skull base. I don't know what it is. Many people, they call it ENT skull base. Still, there are areas of controversies regarding approaches. Every day, there are new approaches, new uh, innovations, new investigations. So this, con this conference, again, will give an opportunity to interact with each other, learn from uh, each other discussions. Once again, I welcome you all for this meeting and have a good time in the conference and uh, go with the happy memories. Thank you very much. I now request the Secretary of Skull Base Surgeon Society of India, Dr. Ashish Suri, to kindly deliver the Secretary's report. Good evening. 
respected dignitaries on the dais, Professor Jian Narayan Reddy, sir, Professor Patima Murthy, ma'am, Professor Rajneesh Kachara, Professor Indra Devi, ma'am, Professor uh, Dwarkanath, my seniors, and my dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. On the behalf of the Skull Base Surgery Society of India, myself as the secretary of the esteemed society, heartily welcome you all for the 23rd conference of the Skull Base Con 22 at Bangalore. The society was established, as Professor Kachar said, in 1998 to, to enable and enhance the training, education, and research in the field of skull based surgery. Presently, the society has nearly 600 members from neurosurgery and also from ENT. The skull based surgery is a complex, and we've seen today's surgeries unpredictable and highly technically demanding, with requiring mastery of both the microsurgical skills, the neuroendoscopic skills, techniques which have a long learning curve, and, and this high dependence on technological adjuncts from neuroimaging, neuronavigation, neuromonitoring, and surgical instrumentation, etc. The society highlights include the interim workshops, the annual uh, conference, short-term training fellowships, and we are thankful to the Department of Neurosurgery, Nimans Bangalore, We have witnessed the past two days of endonasal endoscopic skull base wo workshop, the high speed drilling workshop, the micro suturing workshop, the temporal bone dissection workshop, and the live operative workshops today, three in a row, being uh, concurrent transmissions, and Professor B.S. Das Memorial lectures today evening. The next two days shall be packed sessions with invited talks from national and international leaders, orations, 2D and 3D video sessions, awards, and three paper sessions and posters. We thank all the faculty and delegates from all over India and abroad. I've been told there are 350 registrations. My special thanks to Professor Ohata, Professor Goto, Professor Terasaka from Japan, and my friend Professor Frolish from France. I sincerely thank the organizers under the leadership of Professor Indra Devi and the organization of Professor Dwarkanath and all the faculty, residents, and staff of Neurosurgery Department of Nimhans Bangalore. I've seen Tremendous work over the last two days, especially the skills lab, the cadaver lab, and the ORs, meticulous planning. Thank you, everyone. I take the responsibility for all the lapses and shortcomings, and you can tell me in confidence of all the, and we can, uh, we can improve in future. I also invite, take this opportunity to invite you all for the next year's Skull Base Conference, uh, Skull Base Con 2023. That'll be in October, November at Lucknow being jointly organized by SGPGL Lucknow, the KGMU Lucknow, and the RML Lucknow. Thank you. I now request our guest of honor, Vice Chancellor and Director, Dr. Pratima Murthy, to kindly address the gathering. Good evening, everyone. Dr. Jain Narayan Reddy, former director of NIMHANS, Dr. Rajneesh Kachra, president of the SPSSI, the secretary, Dr. Ashish Suri, my colleague and friend, Dr. Indra Devi, the chair of the organizing committee, Dr. Dwarkanath, head of the Department of Neurosurgery, uh, Dr. Sampat, who's also going to be felicitated today, all the delegates of this conference, the alumni of neurosurgery department, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of NIMHANS and on my personal behalf, let me invite you to this conference. It's actually been very exciting for me as well because I think of the last couple of months you've been discussing what's gonna happen and uh, it's fairly quick in succession uh, after the June conference that was held here, where we met a lot of the alumni, and following up soon after to have a really fantastic array of activities. Yesterday, I had the pleasure of, again, going to the, uh, the skill-based lab and the cadaveric uh, demonstration yesterday, which was multidisciplinary and very exciting. The few minutes that I was there, it was really exciting to look at how precisely people were, the various uh, uh, faculty involved were actually demonstrating the various techniques. And of course, 
this afternoon I listened to the plenary lecture. Uh, and as uh, Dr. Suri was mentioning, the developments in the field are clearly phenomenal, uh, both in terms of technology, in terms of techniques, in terms of neuro navigation. And I think it's so important more than ever to keep in touch with the techniques, communicate with each other, and thankfully, after a couple of years of doing it online, it's nice to, you know, to talk to each other, to actually see things being done live, and to learn. And it's particularly, I think, encouraging for the younger neurosurgeons in training to have an opportunity to really uh, you know, train in many of these techniques, which might not have been possible for various reasons, even you know, up to a decade ago. I want to compliment the Department of Neurosurgery for really being able to put so many things together. And I think we must always remember that we stand on the shoulders of giants. And that's where we need to go back to the people who made it possible. I can only talk about Nimhans. I'm sure right across the country there have been you know, giants in terms of neurosurgeons who have led, who have kind of started the whole specialty, who have really led to the growth of the specialty. At least at Nimhans, of course, one can not but recall very fondly uh, Dr. R.M. Verma, who con completed his centenary year recently. Uh, I think Dr. Verma's contributions uh, to the development both of Nimhans as well as the specialty of neurosurgery, his contribution in terms of chemothalamotomy, I think are very, very well known across the world uh, as well as throughout the country. And I think I had the fortune to know Dr. Varma reasonably well because of his interest. I mean, because of his varied interest in a variety of areas beyond neurosurgery. Uh, and it was wonderful actually documenting his various contributions uh, to the specialty as well as uh, to the institution. Dr. Jain Narayan Reddy is here. Uh, he again, in terms of being a doyen and a great contributor to so many different aspects of this institution and again to the discipline. Uh, so it's, it's a pleasure to have you back here. We had to have you online <laughs> in the program in June. So it's always great to have him here, to see him review the growth of the specialty and the discipline over the decades and continue to give advice I know he visited the skill lab the day before yesterday uh, and uh, you know, kind of uh, made himself up to date with all the facilities that we've developed. So it's, it's really great to have him. My one twinge of regret is that Dr. B.S. Das could not be amongst us. Again, despite all his infirmities, he was here in June with us. He was on the stage. I remember he did not want to sit down. He wanted to actually come up to give all the awards, as well as recognitions to all the staff, I remember, of the Department of Neurosurgery, who had served the department over the years. So in some ways, I think that was his swan song as far as Nemans is concerned. I saw him described as a gentle giant, which he was indeed. And I think his contribution in bringing people together, if there's one thing perhaps we can do to the memory of Dr. Das, especially the Department of Neurosurgery, it is to come together as a team because I think there is such a huge amount of strength in this department. There is so much talent in this department that if everyone works together, there's so much more contribution that this department can give. And I really hope to be able to you know, support and nurture the further growth of the department so that in turn, the department can contribute to the growth of neurosurgery in India. I also wanted to compliment Dr. Indra Devi, who's the most new kid on the block in terms of superannuation. She's just a, a week now, Indra. Is it already a week now? No, it's three days away. It's three days since her superannuation. And I wanted to say that, you know, there was such an outpouring of affection that we saw, right? You know, throughout the day, of, on the 31st of uh, October, and Indra, of course, the, uh, the, this thing for her, the, she was called the lioness of neurosurgery, and I understand the only madam in the department of neurosurgery. I remember these two things. So, 
I think it is to Indra's credit. And more importantly, I think uh, since Indra has been here in our institution, I was you know, contributing so much to the Department of Neurosurgery, I just checked with her that we have six young women uh, trainees in neurosurgery. So I want you all to stand up. I think it's probably the first time it, you know, you've broken a record in the country. So don't feel shy. Just stand up and get yourselves a standing ovation. Because I think that's really something. It tells you how long we've come. And I think it's wonderful. And I hope you'll have a wonderful time. This is, please sit down. It's not to undermine the other <laughs> neurosurgery residents who have also joined. I know it's a tough call. I know it's, it's, you know, you're always on your toes. But the learning that's here, I'm sure, will, you know, will make up for, you know, for the long hours that you work. And I don't think you can get a better place to work in as Nim Hands. So once again, it's a pleasure to see all of you. And I hope you have a great time catching up with the newer techniques, learning new things, but also meeting old friends and taking your conversations forward. All the best for the conference, and thank you very much. I now request our chief guest, former director, Dr. G. N. Narayan Reddy, sir, for his inaugural address. Bhagavate Sri Aravinda Namaha Om Ananda Mai Chaitanya Mai Satya Mai Parame <coughs> The President of the Skull Bay Surgery Society of India, Dr. Rajanesh Kachara, the Secretary, Dr. Ashish Suri, Director of NIMHAT, Dr. Pratima Murthy, Chairperson of the Organizing Committee, Dr. B. Indra Devi, Organizing Secretary, Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas, my colleagues, many of them are here, Dr. Timma Pehgde, Sampath, and Baligar and others, and uh, delegates of the conference, staff, faculty of neurosurgery department. It's a great pleasure to be here with you all. And I'm thankful to Dr. Dwarkanath, Organizing Secretary and the Organizing Committee for inviting me to, the, to be the chief guest and inaugurate the conference. Looking at the all short speeches, I'm wondering whether I should cut down or bring it down. Anyway, whatever it's worth, I will share how the department has grown. First of all, I'm thankful, rather I'm grateful to the grace of God and Divine Mother for giving me this opportunity to see the department growing from the scratch to the present day and able to witness the whole development. Considering that, probably that is the only credential I have got to be in front of you to inaugurate this conference. And on this occasion, we have to remember with gratitude Two great persons has already been mentioned. One is Dr. M. Govind Swami, founder, director of All India Institute of Mental Health, and second is Dr. Ra R. M. Verma, founder, director of NIMHANS. Dr. Govind Swami was a great visionary. He was the one who conceived, conceptualized, implemented to bring all the disciplines of brain and mind 
together under one roof. And he was my mentor too. That's how the Department of Neurology, Neurosurgery, Neuroradiology, Neuropathology, Biophysics and other departments came into this All India Institute of Mental Health. In 1957, I was the assistant surgeon working in the mental hospital. After completing the rounds in the female psychiatric ward, Dr. Gowan Swami told me to apply for the DPM, DPM course to do the psychiatry. When I mentioned to him, I'm not interested, sir, I want to do surgery, immediately turned and told me, good. I want you to become a neurosurgeon, but do the DPM, it will help you. I had not heard of neurosurgery as a specialty in my life. Neurosurgery was nowhere existing in Karnataka. No medical college was teaching about it. That's how Dr. Govind Swami sowed the seed of neurosurgery in the institute as well as in me. Dr. In 1958, Dr. Rajmarathan Verma, R.M. Verma, was deputed from Central Government of Government Health Services to the All India Institute of Mental Health to start neurosurgery. He has to start with nothing except probably small operating theater in the middle of the psychiatric ward. So with that, he started with all enthusiasm, commitment, and dedication, and personal effort to see that the seed is sprouts without perishing. I was, at that time, the RMO in the mental hospital, as well as doing my DPM course. So I was his first assistant to help him. So that's how the neurosurgery began. And in 1960, I was, after completing my DPM, I was deputed by the government of Karnataka with scholarship to specialize in neurosurgery. When I came back in 66, I was posted to the same hospital. And I started working with Dr. Varma. In 1967, Dr. Varma was promoted as a professor and posted to J.B. Panth Hospital in Delhi. But he came back in 1969 when Dr. Surya took a voluntary retirement as a director and professor of neurosurgery. I'm just telling you how the department step by step is developed. Then in 1974, when Nimhans was formed, he continued as the founder director of Nimhans, and I was made as the professor and head of the Department of Neurosurgery. Of course, I was continued as a medical superintendent also. In 1980, when I became 1979 as a director, in 1980, Dr. B.S. Das was appointed in my place as a professor head of the department. So that's how the department developed. Subsequently, after Das, a lot of stalwarts like uh, Professor Shastri, Chandra Mauli, Sampat, Indra, all the heads of the department, uh, present and past faculties, have supported to develop the department. Though I retired in 1990, I had, I, am, I was aware partly of the various developments of the department and even attended some events. But then I thought I had not visited the 
sub specialty hospital of dr verma which is in the dr r m verma's name so at the request at my request dr dorkna took me around just two days ago the hospital i took me around the department i was had i had my own old nostalgic memories in addition i was delighted to and also amazed and overwhelmed to see the expansion additions infrastructure development art of state of art equipment this is really i was t- taken in the great way that to all the facilities for patient care facilities for teaching and training problems developing a center for skill development center and as well as research facilities it was a great heartening condition to me then what i want to say subsequently is i was the that we can see how this seed sown in psychiatric ward became a plant and how this plant was transplanted to neurocenter and where it grew as a big tree yielding rich delicious fruits which have been spread all over the country and we are seeing the benefit of that today i must share i felt a little sad when i was going through the sub specialty center it has a, such a wonderful infrastructure such a art of state of art equipment many of them are underutilized at present and particularly when i saw two operating theaters with the full sophisticated equipment not being used of course there may be many many reasons for that but what i appeal to the director and authorities as well as the faculty of all the disciplines concerned should work together make a concentrated cooperative effort to see that they are all fully utilized bring the benefit of that to the student, to the patients at present i am told there is about 3 to 4 months waiting list i understand i am sure that can be cut down not only that the sophisticated equipment can be utilized to develop innovative techniques and research facilities can be made use of fully at the same time the with this appeal at the same time i must express my great satisfaction and gratification to see that the department of neurosurgery why a whole institute as a whole in all the disciplines has stood up to its main objectives main objectives of service teaching and training and research facilities happy to note that in all the areas the institute is doing excellently well and service has been the priority that is even continued even today the other day when i was met the director dr prathima murthy she was telling me how the service facilities are being extended in different ways to reach the community they are making use of the platforms of general hospitals schools and various other ngos 
to develop an interaction between the institute and the community. And I heard yesterday, this evening, from Dr. Prasivamurthy, the mental health sante which happened just two days ago, or yesterday, sorry, yesterday was a great success. There were about 49 NGOs or 2,000 people contributed. So that gives a pride and happiness that institute is doing so well. With this, I would like to share that, <coughs> that our profession is evolving in a rapid speed and reaching leaps and bounds compared to what we went through with our primitive equipment, primitive understanding. And even to some extent I feel, knowing what is happening today, it was even barbaric. We used to, we have to do the manual exercises manually, all the investigations like angiograms, pneumoencephalograms, ventriculograms. Not only we, we had to go through the struggle with all this, my patients were put into a lot of inconvenience. Today, all that has changed. This diagnosis has become so easy. And we have got developed so much of new technology, sophisticated instruments. With all this, you have grown rapidly in the area. But when this rapid growth occurs in various fields, there is one danger we have to keep in mind always. We have to remember that there are two faces or two sides for every coin. When there is an explosion of this growth occurs, we tend to depend more and more on technology, forgetting our basic responsibility as a clinician towards the patient. This danger we have to avoid, and our young neurosurgeons to be aware that we must be first be clinicians be humane in our approach. We have to have the first contact, the patient, whoever whom he contacts first, the impression he gets, the confidence he develops, the faith he develops, has that got its own benefits. If the patient is fully confident, has got faith in his doctor, his inner melu, melu of that, will help in healing the surgical operations and helps in total recovery. Let us not forget that in our sophistication with our highly evolved technologies. They are necessary, but we should keep the what is our basic role that we should not suffice. Friends, I'm thankful again to all the organizers for giving me this opportunity to be with you and wish and pray that the deliberation of the conference will be a great success next two or three days, even today and tomorrow and the benefits will reach the patients. That is the main purpose of these conferences and this accumulating knowledge and technology. So thank you very much. Namaste.
May I now request our director, uh, Dr. Pratima Muthi, ma'am, and our chief guest, uh, former director GNR Narayan, ready to felicitate our esteemed faculty who have helped to organize the live operative workshops. I request Dr. Sebastian Frolik to kindly come to the stage. I now request Professor B.K. Mishra sir to kindly grace the stage. May I now request Dr. Shunshuke Terasaka to kindly grace the stage. May I now request Dr. Takio Goto to kindly grace the stage. Now request Dr. Chandrasekhar E. Deopajari sir to kindly grace the stage.
Oh, no, I now request our organizing secretary, Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas, sir, to kindly address the gathering and introduce Professor Bindra Devi, ma'am, and Professor Sampat, sir. It's my pleasant duty to introduce both Professor Indra Devi and Professor Sampat, sir, or Sam and ma'am, as we call them. <laughs> I mean, when I joined, uh, Dr. Sampat took my interview, and he selected me to this institute, and I've been ever grateful, and probably... <laughs> I hope he reciprocates the same. Uh, it's been a long journey and finally culminated uh, with Madam retiring three days back. And I thought I'd never stay in the institution long enough to see uh, the department look so empty without, the, the, without their presence. Because over the past decade, uh, since Dr. Chandramoli retired, both Sampath sir and <coughs> Madam have literally carried the department on their shoulders. Uh, it is said of Madam that, and I think I'll the risk of repeating again, my wife is also here. So there's only one Madam in her lives. So all the other Madams need to have a proper noun in front of them. So whether it's the director, Pratima Madam, or my wife, we had to put a proper name before that, except for Professor Indra, who is always Madam. So whenever for generations of neurosurgeons, whoever come to Nimhans, and who have gone from this hall, when we say madam, it means Dr. Indra. And like the resident said, when madam starts rounds in casualty, the news spreads to the wards, the fans and the lights automatically switch off, <laughs> the corridor becomes uh, empty, and everybody goes back to their work, trying to look serious, whether they're working or not is different, but trying to look serious, because madam is going to come on rounds. And her rounds usually start in the evenings. I mean, apart from the morning rounds, you start in the evening and go on long. And if Madam ever comes and says, see no, you are in trouble. <laughs> and uh, it didn't matter what your rank was. If Madam says, see no, then you have a long lecture ahead of you. I mean, we are proud of our many achievements. Uh, we share the same MS uh, general surgery from PGI Chandigarh. But what we are more proud of is the way she taught us, the way she carried herself, and the way she inspired generations of uh, neurosurgeons who even today when they come uh, make it a point at sharp 5 o'clock to go to her office and uh, <laughs> uh, meet her in the neurosurgery office. I mean, of course, she's been the first senior professor from our department, the first dean of neurosciences from our department, the first controller of examination of neurosurgeons from our department. <laughs> I think after Kanaka, the second most prominent neurosurgeon of this country. And she has multiple papers, multiple uh, uh, articles, multiple surgeries, specialties, uh, brachial flexes, etc. But more important than them is that the way she inspired a lot of neurosurgeons and especially the girls who felt inspired to take up neurosurgery uh, due to Dr. Indra Devi. So, uh, Madam, we are very glad that we have had the opportunity to felicitate you and maybe request you to please sit down so that we'll be able to felicitate you. Thank you.
It's also my pleasant duty to call upon stage Professor Sampat, uh, Professor and former head of the Department of Neurosurgery. A short word about him, I already mentioned that he was the one who was responsible for my selection into this institute and I worked under his unit so many times. And uh, contrary to what Madam said, whenever Dr. Sampath went on rounds, the light automatically switched on. <laughs> so <laughs> if the lights were on, we knew who was coming on rounds. If the lights were off, we knew who was coming on rounds. And um, so suddenly when you're operating, and the best quality of Dr. Sampath was, I mean, you could call him from anywhere. He used to come and stand and uh, help us with the surgery. And, I think all of us felt very brave when Dr. Sampath was around and because he gave, gave us the confidence that uh, complications are a part of life and you go ahead and I will be, I'll take your back. And that is probably the quality uh, which endeared him, us to all of the, uh, endeared him the most to all of us. So when you're operating, he used to come and say, mm, pull baba, you are not pulling properly. That is a tumor is not coming. <laughs> so. Uh, so these, I think all the neurosurgeons who have passed out from Nimans have heard and sir used to stand and I mean, I still remember the first uh, pedicle fusion which we did, sir said, mm, you do, I will stand, I will see. So, and this has been the standard uh, across all the surgeries which we have learned from this institute and countless neurosurgeons who have passed out from here will remember him with fondness for his uh, surgical skills. I mean, uh, the... I mean, six years, seven years ago, he started the clival drilling for bacillar aneurysms, and endoscopy was introduced into Nimhans uh, by, uh, extended endoscopic approaches were introduced into this institute by him. Uh, the RM Burma block, which you see today constructed, was proposed in his tenure, completed in his tenure, and started. And he has been, I mean, the, all the gadgets which we have was first initiated by Sir in 2011. And he had a peculiar, and his uh, punctuality was legendary. I mean, he used to come at 8 o'clock, sharp 8 o'clock, and all of us had to be there uh, when sir, before sir came. So thank you, sir, for inspiring a lot of us, including me, and we welcome onto the stage. I now request our organizing secretary, Dr. Dwarkanath Srinivas, to kindly deliver the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's always a nice thing if you have very nice teachers. And it's even nicer if you have very good students and colleagues. And for the first, I would like to thank all my colleagues in the Department of Neurosurgery and my students who turned out to be my colleagues, um, starting with Ari Narsingh Rao, who I think was remote controlling from Vishakhapatnam. Sometimes. <laughs> um, Alok, Dhaval, Nupur, uh, Harsh, Gaurav, uh, Subhash, Gyani, 
uh, all of you, I mean, uh, it's a pleasure to, I mean, you are, you are our students and now you are my colleagues and it's a pleasure to have you in the department and you have been very helpful. The residents, of course, have been usually fantastic, except that they come late. <laughs> but uh, they, whatever work we are given, they always do it and it's really nice to have such a, a nice bunch of residents. Um, I mean, uh, we've tried to incorporate everything. Uh, we've had the cadaver workshop, we've had the uh, temporal bone drilling. Today we had the live operative surgery and keeping my fingers crossed, it went off quite okay, I guess. Uh, of course, there are going to be shortcomings and the shortcomings are all ours, uh, mine rather. And I hope all of you who have come to this city, the garden city, we are enjoying a very nice bit of weather uh, for which Bangalore is very well known for. And I hope you enjoy the city, enjoy the institute and uh, enjoy the academic feast which you have uh, left for the next two days. Welcome to Bangalore and thank you and thank you for coming and making this conference a grand, grand success. And before I end, I'd also like to thank all our sponsors who had, who had a back and who have contributed generously to organizing this conference and making it a grand success. And also the audiovisual team led by Ravi and the Marundeshwara by Gautam who have done a fantastic job in putting this organization together. Thank you all and welcome to Nimhans. Thank you. I request you all to kindly stand for the national anthem. Janagana mana adhinayaka jayahe Bharat bhagya vidhata Punjab, Sindh, Gujarat, Maratha Dravid, Puttada, Vanga Vindya, Himachal, Yamuna, Ganga Ujjal, Jaladhi, Taranga Tava Shubha Name Jage Tava Shubha Aashish Maage Gahe Tava Jaya Gaga Jana Gana Mangana Dayak Jaya He Bharat Bhagya Vidhata Jaya He Jaya He Jaya He we will now hand over the stage for the cultural program. I request our delegates to kindly take the seats. The classical cultural program will start now and dinner will be served at 8 30.
Pretty good. So it's our absolute pleasure to welcome Chords, the ensemble a classical fusion band, uh, who will play a soulful rendition for us. Hello all. Um, we are Chords, the instrumental ensemble, and we are very, very happy to perform in front of all, all of you. Uh, I would like to introduce the instrumentalists here. Uh, myself, Rakshit, I play the flute. Arjun plays the sitar. Viva Jamadagni plays the violin. Uh, Anurag plays the bass guitar. Abhiram plays the mridangam. Satya Pramod plays the tabla. And Chirag is playing key keyboard and harmonium. So I would like to thank Padmanjali ma'am and uh, VK sir for making this happen. I hope you all have a wonderful time. Sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
The first composition which we'll be presenting is a uh, Karnatic Ganesha Kriti, which is Vatapi Ganapatim. This is based in Raga Hamsadwani and this is set to Aditala. I hope you all enjoy it.
I hope you liked Vata Pe Ganapatim. The next composition is going to be a small instrumental composition in the raga Behag, and this is set to Aditya. I hope you all like it.
a small instrumental composition in the raga kiravani Thank you. 
the next composition uh, is going to be manavyala kinchara in the raga narina kanti and set to aditala
The next composition is going to be Nagumumu Galaneni in the Raga Abheri and it is set to Adithara. <laughs> Thank you. 
नेक्स्ट कॉम्पोजिशन इज गोन बी रघुवंश सुधा इन द रागा कदन कुतूहला सटिन आदि ताला
I now request uh, Dr. B.A. Chandraboli, sir, and uh, Dr. Dwarkanath Shinivas, sir, head of department neurosurgery, to kindly felicitate the group. Can they come here? Or? Yeah, they can come. Mm -hmm. Leave on. Yeah. The photo is being taken. Thank you.